welcome to the Libertas Media Project. Here's your host, Brian Wilson. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, and those of you still searching for a gender-acceptable restroom, welcome to Judging Freedom, a little something to offset that lump of coal you're getting in your stocking this year. Joining me once again is Fox News' most senior judicial analyst, best-selling author of remarkable books about freedom, which, by the way, are still available for readers on your gift list, former Superior Court judge for the embarrassing state of New Jersey, and purveyor of one of the world's outstanding maple syrups, Judge Andrew P. Napolitano. Brian, how are you, dear friend? Judge, I'm uh, I'm doing all right, although it's a little nippy uh, these days. I'm not a big fan of winter, but I guess the canyons of Manhattan are a hell of a lot worse than it is here. They are very, very cold. Very cold. They look cold and they feel cold. <laughs> Isn't that right? In, in winter, I remember when I lived off Columbus Circle, it didn't look hot in the summertime, but in the wintertime when it was cold, it looked cold and felt cold. Yes, it? yes. Nicely put. Today it is cold and it looks cold and we're still in the fall. Yeah, yeah that's right. I haven't even made it to winter yet. Well, Judge, another week, uh, another action-packed episode of the uh, Mueller investigation, soon to be uh, made for TV soap opera, and it might be amusing if it wasn't so serious. G- generally speaking, though, uh, Judge, since our last look at this thing, the news, at least Fox News, studiously avoided by, by all, I think, of the uh, three major networks, has reported on what appears to be significant problems with uh, Bob Mueller's work product. Millions of taxpayer dollars for three fairly innocuous players in matters not uh, related at all to this Trump Russia, Russia, Russia collusion allegation. Oh, a quick uh, clarifying sidebar on that, Your Honor. Uh, you've told us over the past that collusion was a made up media term, not a legal reality per se. Right. And uh, and also that a special prosecutor cannot be appointed without identifying a crime. So I, I got to think about it. So, well, what exactly is the crime that was specified uh, to Mueller and that he is pursuing? Two uh, potential crimes. One, did uh, the campaign, did the Trump campaign receive something of value from a foreign government? That is a crime. Two, did the campaign assist a foreign government, namely Russia, to uh, hack into or uh, the computer systems of any entity in the United States? That would be a crime. Actually, three. Three, was there an agreement to do any of this? Okay. So the prosecutor's favorite charge is conspiracy, because a conspiracy is an agreement to do something wrong. And you only need one person in the agreement to take a step, a material step in furtherance of the agreement, and then everybody in the agreement can be indicted and uh, and prosecuted for a conspiracy. Yeah. So that's probably what Bob Mueller uh, is looking at, just like um, enemy combatant person of interest Mm -hmm. collusion is a media word so when somebody says there's no such crime as collusion the answer is that's true that's not the 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 crime that Mueller is uh, is looking for but in the process of uh, putting forth the case in order to uh, establish the special prosecutor you said that there was a potential uh, involvement is potential uh, crime? I, I would have thought that they would have had to have come forward with some actual hard evidence. And there are some crimes. There are some crimes called incipient crimes, which do not require completion. So conspiracy, a conspiracy to commit a, a crime, the crime doesn't have to be completed. An attempt, the crime doesn't have to be completed. Obstruction of justice, you don't have to, have to succeed in obstructing. You you only have to uh, interfere. With the with the government uh, function, so there are some crimes that don't require completion that the government can uh, can prosecute for. Now, did Bob Mueller know what he was looking for before he started? I don't know. Is it fair to take a snapshot picture of him now and say you spent spent you spent seven million? What have you got to show for it? No, absolutely not. Uh, the government spends a fortune on prosecutions, and the only time we're going to say a snapshot is when they're ready for us to see it. You're talking about putting together a jigsaw puzzle of thousands of pieces, and it makes no sense until those last few pieces are in there. Yeah. Well, on that note, um, what about that in the context of Mueller, special prosecutor, uh, federal operation, taxpayer dollars? Is there nothing within the format of that entity that requires Mueller 
at some point to be forthcoming with, well, how much of the puzzle you got done so far? If I'm looking over your shoulder doing a big old puzzle, I can at least get, oh, there's a there's a, an ugly hole, you know, whatever. It's a good question. He is required to report uh, in six-month intervals to the authority that appointed him, which in this case is Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein. That That's the only report he has to come uh, forth with, uh, forward with. Uh, later today, Rosenstein's going to be testifying in public and under oath. There's a lot of questions they're going to ask him, and a lot he'll uh, he'll refuse to answer. I still would have dissented, along with Justice Scalia, on the statute creating a special prosecutor. Now, that statute doesn't exist anymore. Mueller's office is created by a court rule. A court rule is written by Congress. So Congress contemplated this when it wrote the rule, and it basically says if the Justice Department can't investigate someone because of a conflict, meaning too many of its own people may be involved in the person or thing being investigated, it can appoint an, an outside team. And then that outside team just spends money and, and runs for the roses and is essentially unanswerable and wants to indict people to justify its own existence. Summarizing the Scalia dissent. Yeah, well, uh, it, it gets so uh, convoluted, uh, which was one of my other questions with uh, with respect to last week's installment and touching on what you just said. When the new FBI director, Chris Ray appeared before the House Judiciary Committee, he pretty much, um, I think it's safe to say, stonewalled questions of substance on the so-called Trump dossier, uh, FISA warrants, Peter Strzok, and all the rest of that. Wasn't, isn't Ray under any legal obligation to answer questions that are forthcoming on the essential issues, at least to inform laymen like me who uh, don't have the intimate knowledge of uh, the twists and turns of the law that you just spelled out? It depends on what the questions are, Brian. Often these questions are very inartfully asked by politicians looking for 15 seconds uh, on the evening news. They're not asked by professional cross-examiners or even by lawyers that are uh, accustomed to doing anything like this. I have been a, a major critic of the way Congress uh, interrogates people who stand before them. I remember having a conversation with uh, Trey Gowdy this is about a year and a half ago, and he said to me, what questions would you ask Mrs. Clinton? This is before her 13-hour uh, public Q&A session. Uh, if you were on the committee, I said, I wouldn't ask her anything. What do you mean you wouldn't ask her anything? I said, I wouldn't ask her anything. I would hire an attack dog like Mike Chertoff and have him do all the questioning. And he said, do you really think I can keep the members of the committee from their 15 seconds of fame? I said, no, I don't know how you could do that. They'll vote you out as chair. But if you guys are really looking for answers rather than just 15 seconds in front of the camera, you'll get a professional cross-examiner. They don't do that anymore. They used to, but they don't do it uh, anymore. Wouldn't that have been uh, Gowdy's option with respect to uh, doing, say, behind closed doors, where uh, that kind of nonsense would never have uh, never have come out but still would have been under oath? I condemn the behind closed doors. I mean, the Congress works for us. Who the heck are they to have knowledge of what the government is doing that uh, that we don't? But closed doors is an interrogation behind a truthfully answered interrogation behind closed doors is better than a a non answered uh, transparent interrogation. Right. Right. Well, that's what I was saying, you know, from the standpoint of the fact that, well, it, just finessing the way around the problems with other committee members and their precious media time, that would be, that wouldn't even be available to them on the behind closed doors. And we'd still have the, the tape running and notes being taken, uh, which all would have been released to the public, which, like you said, right. I, I'll take that. I can read it. I don't have to hear it. The behind closed doors is not released to the public, except under very narrow circumstances. What happens is the Democrats come out and give their version of what they say just happened, and Republicans come out out and give their version of what they say just happened. And there's some truth in both uh, versions, uh, but there's also other materials that each side doesn't want to tell you about. I mean, I just <laughs> condemn all this government uh, secrecy. Do they work for us or do we work for them? Oh, I, I totally agree. On the other hand, all you do is wait 48 hours and you'll read about it in the New York Times. Well, so, almost everything uh, comes out, like Peter Strzok's uh, texts. Everything comes out. Well, on, on his um, note, 
The latest is, of course, uh, Peter Strzok's revealing texts to his cuddle buddy, another FBI employee. And I heard some of them on Fox and Friends this morning being read. Uh, they reveal in, in rather explicit terms neither one had a whole lot of love for President Trump. I doubt this is a federal crime, but uh, texting to one another. But does it reveal anything of substance that might impact no. the overall investigation? No. Okay. No, it doesn't, and I'm not surprised by any of it. I mean, FBI agents are not choir boys, and under the statute they are entitled to express opinions. And as human beings, they have opinions like the rest of us on political, legal, uh, social and and uh, cultural matters. In fact, Brian, I've been arguing uh, in my day job at Fox for about 10 days now. It is not uncommon for cops, FBI agents, and prosecutors to hate, H-A-T-E, the target or the defendant that they are investigating or prosecuting. Do you expect them to be morally neutral about bank robbers or crooked politicians or 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 terror suspects? Of course not. We expect indifference from judges and jurors, but not from prosecutors and cops. So none of this surprises me. I think it's a it's a sanctimonious stew uh, prepared and stirred by people unfamiliar with the way law enforcement works in the real world. Well, let me ask you a question on that point. I, I understand totally the cop and the bank robber, the rapist, the murderer, uh, and so on. Uh, but wouldn't it be safe to say, fair to say, accurate to say that those are those are rather uh, singularly contained offenses and individuals and a very limited number of people? Isn't it also possible, considering human nature, psychology, politics, power, money, deep state, all that jazz, that when you get into these other areas, there can be that attitude, that prejudice, could be motivational to individuals to leave this paragraph out, change this phrase, move this sentence, not return this call, slow walk this file, all these things that would uh, that would obfuscate the the attempt to move towards justice. I'm, I'm sorry to tell you, it is not a pure process. But people who think that prosecutors sit down and decide, is so-and-so guilty, let's see what the evidence shows, again, are unfamiliar with the process. Prosecutors will say, we get enough evidence to convict, we need more. Uh, this case against Hillary is, is garbage. Let's see what's out there that exonerates her. That's the way it works. You have a preconceived judgment, and you look for evidence to reinforce it. Now, you can't manufacture evidence. You can't destroy evidence. FBI agents work in pairs, and whatever the pair uncovers or unearths is reviewed by five others who are superior to the pair, and whatever the five find is then reviewed by uh, a team of prosecutors who are lawyers who actually present cases uh, to juries. So there are these efforts to uh, prevent the destruction or overlooking or manufacturing of evidence. But in terms of motivation, and bias, absolutely normal. Again, we're talking about professional investigators, cops, and prosecutors. We're not talking about jurists or or jurors. Well, I, I, I totally understand and accept the fact that I have a, a more idealistic perspective than uh, someone with uh, that even approaches uh, your experience and education, training, and background, and so on. Look, of all FBI agents, were like Ephraim Zimbalist Jr. <laughs> in that famous series that was on for about five or six years, I'm dating myself, in the 60s, uh, called the FBI. I mean, it would be a very, very happy place, but that's not what they're like in the real world. Right. The inquiry boys. But on the other hand, Judge, would it be... Yeah, I, I got you. But uh, with respects to uh, the process of getting to the conclusion and and what the, these people do or don't do. Well, that's didn't... why we don't let them come to conclusion. That's why Jim Comey was wrong on the facts, wrong on the law, and profoundly wrong to decide and declare publicly that Hillary would not be prosecuted. Right. That is not the function of investigators. That's not the function of cops or FBI agents. That's the function of professional prosecutors to decide what, what cases they're going to uh, bring. Exactly, exactly. But, but isn't it true of that... the Bill Clinton, uh, Loretta Lynch, Tarmac uh, meeting, Comey felt he couldn't trust his boss, so he would r remove from her. He's an underling. He works for her. He's going to take this off of her desk to avoid her uh, being embarrassed. Uh, that's hogwash. I'll tell you what also is hogwash is Jeff Sessions' refusal to do anything about this. He is absolutely not bound by that 
July 2015 uh, Comey decision not to prosecute. Well, on that note, uh, two two real quick questions on that. First of all, the uh, the, the question about Comey uh, uh, didn't Comey do exactly what you said that uh, they don't or shouldn't do? Didn't he reach a conclusion and start yes. writing a letter yes. exonerating? Yes, and uh, it should not be, and it should not be accepted blithely by his successors, and it apparently is. Being in the, as far as I know, there's been no reexamination of the case by uh, a fresh pair of eyes under Chris Ray, and there's been no re-examination of the case by prosecutors under uh, Jeff Sessions, and there should be. Did she lie when they interrogated her? For Under what circumstances did the government agree not to prosecute uh, her aides? And is there evidence of her guilt? I think the answers to those questions, except for the agreement not to prosecute her aides, is fairly obvious, but it's a hot potato that nobody wants to touch. Interesting. Final question with regards to Mr. Sessions, Attorney General Sessions, uh, and his um, and his recusal. Is there a bright yellow line uh, that says where that recusal stops and his responsibilities begin again, or does any sentence that has the word Russia in it, like what's the capital of Russia, uh, he's not allowed to, or his rec- recusal prevents him from uh, commenting? I don't know the answer to that. I don't know if the recusal uh, is in writing, but I do know there was a perception in the land amongst Judges, lawyers, FBI agents, prosecutors, cops, and now politicians and the public of too much reticence on the part of uh, Jeff Sessions. He seems to be a figurehead that they ship out to give speeches rather than a person rolling up his sleeves, reviewing evidence, deciding who should be prosecuted for what. He's leaving that to a bunch of Republican never-Trumpers in the Justice Department. You wonder why the pre- you wonder why the president's not happy. Yeah, uh, I'd like to see him get as as exercised about the that situation as he does about legalizing marijuana. But that's just uh, yeah. that's just me. Next week, uh, Judge, it's our Judging Freedom seventh annual Christmas party. No cameras will be allowed, so come as you are. Looking forward. All the best, Brian. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Judge. Thank you for spending time with the Libertas Media Project. For the latest information on our podcasts, visit our Facebook page, facebook.com slash Libertas Media Project. Comments, questions, observations, welcome. Please come back soon for our next podcast with Brian Wilson from the Libertas Media Project.